We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and welcome to part four of our F1 team genealogy series, where we have made it to kind of the home stretch, if we think about it. I know, I can't believe we've already, this is already part four, and I'm like, but at the same time, I'm like, I just want to get to part five. All I know. All I to do is talk about part five. <laughs> but we are in part four, which is super exciting. So if you have not listened to parts one through three yet, we are going through the genealogies of all the current F1 teams on the grid, where they started, when they started, who they've been, who they are now. Um, we have some who have not changed hands, Ferrari, McLaren. That is covered in episode one. Episode two is Haas and Williams. Episode three was... V-Carbon Steak. V-Carbon Steak. A classic me forgetting about steak. Just par for the course. Um, and today we are covering Red Bull and Mercedes. So if you think there's a theme in all of these, there definitely is. Catherine and I group them together in kind of likeness of changing of names, rebrands, things like that. And I'm actually really excited to talk, to talk about Red Bull and Mercedes today, mostly because I have to sit and listen to you talk about Mercedes <laughs> for a while. And I'm just, you know, and also you get to like, you just like spark up when we talk about Red Bull. You're like, and Red Bull! And the other like, Mercedes. <laughs> and also Mercedes. Yeah, also this Mercedes. this will be more of, of me being forced to say nice things about Lewis Hamilton, which, you know, As we know, that is one of those things that I have to do on this podcast, even though he is not my favorite driver. But we'll get there. We're going to start with Red Bull, mostly because Mercedes is going to take a little bit longer. But I just, this this whole project has been very interesting and like very fascinating. And it's cool. And I also like sports. So there we go. Yay, sports. (laughs) Yay, pretty much. Okay. So let's get into Red Bull. So the Red Bull that we know and love today started not so far back, actually. So in 1997, they were founded and they were Stewart Grand Prix. So Jackie Stewart, we all know and love him, (laughs) especially on Gridwalks. He founded the team with Paul Stewart, who's the then team principal. And And also his son. I was going to say, and there's a familial connection there. So that's his son, yeah. um, which I always knew that like Stuart Grand Prix was a team. It just didn't register to me that it was previous, like the, in the familial family tree of Red Bull. Yeah. I mean, there throughout the, the history of, of Formula One, there have been a number of, you know, former drivers that have come on to, you know, basically build their own teams. You know, Jackie Stewart, obviously one of them, the Fittipaldi family, they had a team on the grid, as we talked about, they kind of petered off after a while. We talked about them in the Williams episode, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. They weren't very good, but you know, they tried and and it's very interesting because like in the in the grand scheme of like all of the teams and all of the constructors that have become you know that are known in formula one a lot of them did not have you know major wins major acclaim that really only comes down to like the big name teams that we know of today ferrari mclaren mercedes red bull etc renault and we'll talk about renault but you know, for the most part, like there are not a lot of teams that have been in like the, that have really breached the top five or even the top three of the driver standings or constructor standings. Right. And I think it's really interesting because they'll have these rebrands or they'll be bought out or new people come in and you would think that would maybe revitalize the team and bring some life to it, inject some funds, money is king in F1. We all know that. Right. But it really has kind of been, if you were in the bottom you've stayed in the bottom which i think is really interesting because like if you think of other professional sports or leagues when you get a new owner you inject new life a lot more money into the team and you i'm not going to say 100 percent of the time but generally see like an uptick in their performance and like last week's episode talking about steak and v-carb v-carbs has really just been rebrands and i guess steak sauber has been as well but they've kind of always been at that same level They've never really gotten, I mean, 
Pierre Gasly did win for Alphatari. I digress. But they've never truly, like, jumped into constructors. Yeah, and I think some of it had to do with the, you know, massive disparity in team budgets. Before we had the budget cap era, you have a team like Mercedes that could invest a an obnoxious amount of money That's to their really team, whereas, uh, you know, other teams that, you know, thinking, you know, back in the day, Jaguar, Stewart, other, you know, former teams that are whose names are escaping me because we've gone through so many teams these last couple of weeks, but they all there don't will be have a quiz at the end of this, Catherine. There will be a quiz, <laughs> but they, as long as it's open note and I can cheat, we're good. But they, they're, they're, not all the teams have infinite amounts of money. And we actually, we see that problem right now with Haas. Like one of right. Haas's primary issues is they are forced to do so much with so little money. And we all know how, how, how good Haas is as a, as a Formula One team. They're, they're not in the top tier. And that's one of the reasons why. And the budget yeah. cap helps, but it doesn't solve all the problems. Right. So getting back to Red Bull, I think this is one of the teams that's interesting because they started not very good. And then now the Red Bull that we know today, I mean, not necessarily this year. <laughs> well, they're, they're not, they're doing fine this year, but they've been constructors champion the last like, what, three years? Two yeah. Years? Three. Yeah, three. 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 <laughs> Wait, no, two. it's just two. two. It's two. two. Mercedes Max had it in twenty one. Max, is three, Max is three. They have two. Mercedes. Yeah, there we yep. go. Um, yeah. So I think this one is interesting because Red Bull has had success, and even er the earlier two thousands as well. They've had a lot of success, but they didn't always start out that way. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it's very interesting. And to to turn back to Stuart before we actually get to Red Bull, one of the things that that kind of jumped out to me was looking at their first drivers in that first season yes. in 1997. The drivers: Rubens Barrichello and Jan Magnussen, aka Kevin Magnussen's dad. Which this blows my mind because I don't know how I blanked this out that K Mags is a nepo baby, like. I had, I it didn't even <laughs> register with me. Yeah, I, I was, I think the first time I noticed it was watching the, I think watching the Braun documentary. And I, cause I, I think I he, he, I think he was featured in it. Um, And yeah, I, th I think he was. And then I had to like, look it up. And like, he also had Kevin really young because he's not that old either. Right. So, and the Kevin Magnuson's age in relation to my own age is one of the ones that jumps out to me is not computing because he's younger than I am, but doesn't look it. But that was, that was, that was actually the first driver that I ever had like an age crisis about realizing how much younger he is than me. I think mine is Checo. Cause like, just, I feel like Checo just, he seems like he's a 45 year old man and then he's it's my like, age I, yeah he's like a few years older than me I think that's the one that's weird to me yeah yeah yes. so I just I, I thought it was so interesting those two drivers because Rubens Barrichello is like one of my favorites like you know always the bridesmaid never the bride type of drivers yeah, especially exactly. because because of his partnership with Michael Schumacher and that was just like he did. He he was he was the Valtteri Botas of that pairing. If you, if you compare Schumacher and and Barrichello and Hamilton and, and Botas, like Botas and Barrichello are basically like that same role of. And I mean, he, even role player wise, as Perez is with Max. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. So unlike some of the other teams, though, like they weren't amazing, they weren't stellar, but they did have a win. So that's you know, better than some of the teams that we've covered already. So it actually came really late in Stuart Grand Prix's or span of being a team. So they won their first race in the 1999 European Grand Prix, which was their, the team's 47th Grand Prix, which is actually their third to last, but yeah. the 644th F1 race. Which, yeah. Again, if you think of Ferrari, they won the 12th <laughs> F1 race, which is insane. Yeah. Um, but but I, I love that stat that we, you came up with. I just think it's really interesting to see like when these teams come onto the grid and how long it takes for them to win. 
Yeah, I thought it was really interesting too. And then like when I was looking at when they had the win in relation to how long the team has existed and, you know, when it was going to move on to, to its next iteration, like, oh, not only was it the their last season as Stewart, but it was the end of the season. Yeah, it came very late. They almost went winless. Yeah, they, they did. And Johnny Herbert, who was very known throughout Formula One, he was the one who did it. He, and and he and Barrichello helped the team to a P4 finish at that time with only 36 points. The 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 way the way point allocations worked like before the the point system that we have now is just so funny to me how you can have so few points and still be like, oh, we're you know top three, top four on the on the grid. So that was just really funny for me. Yeah. Also, I think it's interesting that again we have this situation where like my man Joseph Verstappen <laughs> was a driver for this team um, yeah so he drove for only half of the 1998 season um but it's just cool that this eventually became Max's team yeah yeah the Joseph Verstappen is is a funny little he just keeps popping just up everywhere whole episode of Joseph's Joseph's life, like the life of Jose. Yeah, I mean, he does have a very interesting career. Personal life is also very interesting, and we all know that he is the reason why Max will need therapy one day. But he's not already in it. Yeah, I I mean, I'm. He he might be, but one of is is he is one of the few drivers who has caught fire during a race. Um, there, there was a, he, I don't remember who he was driving for in the nineties and but that back when they actually used to refuel the cars during pits, pit stops, his car sparked and he got fire. He was fine clearly, but that was one of the, the many times that cars have caught fire during refueling incidents that they decided hmm, maybe we shouldn't refuel during races. Maybe, might be a good idea. Maybe. It's all about just increasing safety. It's crazy what the what the race used to look like and how they used to go about it and how it is now. Like it's drastically different. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty wild. Like and and then of course, unfortunately, of course, like every major accident is what leads to all of those advances in safety. Like if you look at Roman Grosjean when he was at Haas and his car exploded in two pieces, like that informed a bunch of the safety stuff for the for the following regulation. And then even Joe Guanyu's crash at Silverstone in 2022, a race that I will always point out that I have never and will never watch. But the way that the halo held up when his car flipped over and he ended up in the tire barrier, that has informed the way that the 2026 iteration of the cars and the halo is going to, you know, the halo has to, have more of it has to it has to be able to hold more strength in order to further minimize incidents involving you know, slipping over right exactly okay so like we said this was this team was not around for very long their first race was in 1997 and then in 2000 this rate this team became jaguar racing f1 team So Ford jumped into the F1 game and they were promoting the Jaguar. So they made the team the Jaguar Racing F1 team. And they first came to the grid in 2000. Yeah. Weren't very good also. Um, They were trash. But worse, worse than Stewart. So, you know, like you said, sometimes, you know, in, in other sports, new team comes in or new ownership, and then you're you're good for a little while. And then you trail off. The Jaguars best season was seven uh, in P, in, yeah, P7 in 2002, three and four. They didn't have any wins. Their best finishes were uh, P, a bunch of P3 finishes um, or a couple, uh, one at the Monaco Grand Prix in 2001 and one at uh, in Monza in 2002, both by Eddie Irvine. And yeah, they just, they, they, they could, they couldn't even bring in Nikki Lauda as a team principal in 2002 and figure out how a way to, you know, turn things around. Which is so, this one is really surprising to me because like Ford Motor Company, huge company, lots of money. You would think they could throw money this way and, and do something with the team. Because like, yeah. imagine if they threw a ton of money and a ton of effort at this back in 2000 and they were successful. Like, the, it's such great brand recognition 
and like I know it's an expensive sport but it's just I just wonder the decision to like kind not to half ass this but like it just feels like they didn't throw the right en- amount of effort into owning an F1 team you know what yeah I mean? yeah it, it does and I mean having not been you know in Formula One you know in that era we're probably missing a number like a, a decent amount of context as to why it didn't work out you know in the way that you know Jaguar probably wanted it to and that Ford Motor Company wanted it to. Obviously, Ford is going to be coming back as an engine supplier for Red Bull in 2026. So they have not completely washed their hands of Formula One. But yeah, it is it is very interesting. They they had a, a you know, other than Eddie Irvine, they had a couple other notable drivers. They had Pedro De La Rosa, Mark Weber, who we'll talk about more, you know, once we get into the Red Bull and Christian Klein. Who, but yeah, it, it really seemed to be kind of a, they were there, they tried, and then we move on to Red Bull. Yes. The team Catherine loves today. My so, favorite team. Dear, uh, Dietrich Mateschitz. My man Dietrich. <laughs> Last name Emily cannot pronounce. Um, so he is the founder of Red Bull Racing. He's also the co-founder of the Red Bull Energy Drink. As soon as the energy drink, energy drink company decided to get into sports. He founded Red Bull Racing, um, and that was in 2005. And so also a fun comparison that I like to make with Ferrari um, around team principles. So if you listen to episode one, you know Ferrari's had like a thousand team principles in like a hundred years, whatever. I'm exaggerating. You get the point. Red Bull, what? like the team now, has had one. So Christian Horner has actually been the team principal since 2005 all the way to present day which I think is wild well it's like yes this you know Red Bull was Dietrich's team but this was also kind of very similar to how Gunther Steiner was the brainchild behind right. you know Gene Haas creating Haas this F1 was like his baby. Christian Horner really is you know, Red Bull racing and, and really, you know, has, is, is, is exactly, is the, is the brainchild of it very similar to the situation with Steiner at Haas. And, you know, this was, this was how Horner went from being kind of a very meh motorsport racer. Cause he did try to make it his way through the circuit right. and didn't, you know, he wasn't going to make it into formula one and he knew that. So he decided to, you know, go a different way. He started up his own team and then eventually, you know, had this big hand in the founding of Red Bull and turning Red Bull into, you know, the, the monster that it is today. <laughs> energy drink joke. Though. Yes. I was funny. <laughs> Boom. But also, like, speaking of being an energy drink company, like, they, they're an energy drink company that has, you know, their their hand in, like, every weird sport there is. Like, if you're watching right. ESPN at 1130 at night on a Thursday, you're probably watching some weird Red Bull version of motorsport, international, whatever, that just kind of happens to exist that is very, very niche, but they're heavily involved in a lot of weird stuff. No, I, yeah. The, so I guess to like circle back on Christian Horner, I think that part of, to me that's interesting. He took, like he started as team principal and still is. But I think it's interesting and maybe it's because of the relationship he had with Dietrich. But there were some years where they drop off, right? Because they had the, the Seb Vettel years, like 2010 to 2013. Right. And then, and now they have the Max Verstappen years. But in between, it's not like they were bad but they weren't winning so like they had the streak of winning and then they kind of drop off a little bit again they still were not at the bottom like some of the teams we've already talked about but generally when you do see a drop you see team principal changes so I wonder like if it's just because this really is his brainchild and he had that close relationship with Dietrich that he got to remain as team principal or if they said like we're still doing good enough to where we don't need to replace a team principal. You know what I mean? Cause like if that was Ferrari, he would have been gone. Right. And I think that like, that's, it, it's, I think a big part of it is like, it's his, it's his brainchild. It's his thing that Dietrich let him have. And, you know, even when, not to bring up the really annoying stuff that happened, you know, going into the 2024 season and all that behind the scenes drama with Red Bull, that's, yeah. you know, whatever, but it's, it's very hard to separate Christian Horner from 
Red Bull. And, you know, when he brings in the likes of Adrian Newey, who of course is going to Aston Martin and Helmut Marco, who has been the advisor for many years, all the people that they've, you know, brought on to continue producing this successful venture, it, there, there's definitely a lot of like, it wasn't bad enough for them to go in a different direction, yeah. considering the like, the general consistency that you have, you know, Otmar sure. Safnauer getting fired in the middle of a race weekend, that's as vicious as Red Bull is with its drivers, they still have a lot of stability outside of it, whether, Agreed. you know, this, and, you know, leaving aside the stability of this season, which is whatever. Yeah, it seems like that, uh, like this current team and the ownership really gives their, I don't want to say staff, because I feel like that's the wrong term, but they're off track personnel. <laughs> so everyone sure. but their drivers, I feel like they give them some grace and they really buy into like the team atmosphere. And when you see almost every team being like, this person's gone, this person's been let go, this person's fired. You really see people from Red Bull, like, not even being let go, but news of them departing because they've left for a better opportunity. You know what right. I mean? You don't see a ton of that um, come out of that garage. And and so I think that's also, that also could play a part into why Christian Horner's been able to stay team principal forever. Yeah. And here's another factor. Between 2009 and 2020, uh, 2020, 2024, between 2009 and 2024, they have finished outside of the top three once. In 2015, they were P4. So they started out 2005 P7, 2006 P7, 2007 P5, 2008 P7, and then P2 in 2009. So they've had a really consistent streak of being a top, you know, top tier team in Formula One. And while you may have a team like Ferrari that would say, you know, oh, well, this we've finished the, like, like the, the streak of P, you know, P2 and, you know, P2, P3 between 2016 and 2021, like that's not good enough. Like you might see that in somewhere like Ferrari, but Red Bull, like that's still some of the best performances and the best consistency that we have until we talk about Mercedes. And, right. I agree. and the other I thing that, that, is is important to note is similar to how Mercedes struggled with the regulation change between 2021 and 2022, Red Bull had that same issue in 2014. So when Mercedes started their dominance, it was really a matter of Red Bull did not have the, you know, did not have a hand on the engineering of the new cars in that era, whereas Mercedes just went off. Yeah. And I think that's something that and maybe not everyone forgets, I forget sometimes, is that you'll have these gap years where they're not consistently winning, like any team. They'll have, like, gap years where they drop or when they really rise, and that all has to do with the regulation changes, which I think makes this sport so interesting. It also, I think, prevents teams from just increased dominance and leaving everybody else in the dust. Like, the constant change of regulations, I think, is so good for this sport because it does give us those variables and those, you know, peaks and valleys of teams trying to understand and get the engineering right. So I think it's really interesting. Yeah, because if you look at the first half of, you know, of that Mercedes dominance era, that was when Red Bull was was really struggling. And then right. there was another, you know, regulation in there as well, where Red Bull was getting a hand on it, getting a hand on it. And then you have Max's world champion win in 2021. So that's, that's, the, the regulation changes are probably one of the best factors for longevity in Formula One because it does allow this opportunity of having some shuffles and there's predicted to be a pretty big shuffle once we get into 2026 and that new era. Again, welcome to the podcast that only talks we about, talk the about the future. We talk about the future. Which is ironic because we're talking about the past. <laughs> right. We're talking about the past, but we're still not we talking about the 2024 season. to not talk about 2024 and talk about the future. <laughs> yeah. And then speaking of, of the past for Red Bull, they... You know, if we want to talk, call this episode modern heavyweights, that really is it. Because if you look at the world champions between, you know, Red Bull and Mercedes, you know, 2010, 11, 12, and 13, all sub Vettel, 22, 23, Max Verstappen, and then constructors wise, 
you know, everything but 2021 also went Red Bull's way. So they are, you know, pretty, they, they were able to bring in some pretty solidly consistent, good drivers, you know, between Vettel and Verstappen. Obviously we have a number of other drivers of note and a lot of them have had either long careers or notable careers but you've got the likes of Christian Klein and Mark Webber who started the the original form you know Red Bull team Max Verstappen Sebastian Vettel then you've got Danny Ricardo, and then of course leaving Red Bull was the worst thing that he could have done for his career Sergio Perez David Coulthard Alex Albon and then of course not- notoriety wise you've got Daniel Kvyat and Pierre Gasly who lost their seats at Red Bull and were demoted to Toro Rosso yeah Kind of flip-flopped that one. You know, generally, you start at Toro Rosso, you go to Red Bull. Flip-flop. Yeah. But yeah, so, yeah, this really is, you know, going into now Mercedes, if you put these two together, from 2010 to 2023, they won every Constructors. Like, they are the most dominant teams combined in the last, what, 15 years? Yeah, something like that. It's wow. kind of absurd when when you when you when you put it that way. Uh, it's that's a that's a lot between two highly competitive teams, and really shows you just how things have evolved and how other teams have really kind of struggled to keep pace with these top two teams. Yeah, and will they make it one more year of dominance? I just have to bring back in the 2024 season. <laughs> right, of course. The 2024 season exists. McLaren, I, I am going to run under the assumption that McLaren is going to win the Constructors' oh, Championship this year, but we'll see. Um, but you speaking of winning, we'll, we'll see about it. But speaking of winning, Red Bull did have their first win as a team at the 2009 Chinese Grand Prix, Spash and Battle, obviously. It was the 74th Red Bull race and the 806th F1 race. Damn. It's crazy yeah. that it took this team so long to win a race. Like, just again, just talking about the dominance that they currently have or have had in the last, you know, 14 years, it took them, what, into their third season? Fourth, fourth season? Yeah, to win a race. Fifth like, season. That's crazy. Fifth season? Yeah. yeah. I don't know how many races there used to be, and I still don't know how many races we're ever going to have in a season. So, okay, took them five seasons. But still, that seems like a lot considering – how dominant they are. They yeah, just, but also they have to have when a little you, bit of a runway. Yeah, but I mean if you look at those first four seasons, they were uh, their best finish was P5 and that was once and the other three seasons in that span were P7s. So it yeah. it took them a minute to, you know, to kind of get there and to turn on that ability to win and then, you know, winning is contagious. So that's where Very true. That's where it keeps going. Very true. Yeah. All right. I think we've given Red Bull enough of our time. I think we have to get into Mercedes. Yeah. Which Mercedes, I feel like, is actually kind of fascinating as it, you know, as a team. And we were talking about this when we started recording because Mercedes came onto the grid pretty early on in the the history of Formula One in the fifties. Time out. But it's Mercedes Benz that came on. Right. Well, technically Daimler Benz AG, but it was the original Mercedes team. But we were talking about before it was words, Catherine, we were talking before we started recording about how Mercedes came on and was immediately dominant in, you know, in the early fifties, they had back-to-back world championships from Juan Manuel Fangio and like then they left motorsport. And of course the reason why they left motorsport was the 1955 Le Mans disaster, where if you don't know, there was a very bad crash that sent debris into the stands that led to the deaths of 83 spectators and one, and the one Mercedes driver. So they basically, they, they left everything and they're like no more motorsport and wouldn't return to, you know, motorsport and Formula One until the 90s as an engine manufacturer before they came back on and we'll get there. But what we were talking about is what would have the Formula One landscape and history looked like if we had a Mercedes dominance in the same era that we had the Ferrari dominance? Like, which I think is such an interesting, like, what if? 
Yeah, like what? And I mean, the the Ferrari dominance wasn't in like the, you know, like right off the start, but they were one of the earliest, they are the earliest original, one of the earliest original teams. But what would have it been like to have the, like a Mercedes with the same longevity and history as Ferrari? Like how many more wins would they have had? What would that have been like? Because they they came on and there was no reason for them to come off other than this obvious tragedy. What would it have been like if they were, like, would they have been the most dominant team ever? Right, because they left when they were doing good. It's not like they left because they couldn't afford the team because they were just blowing money and they saw. Like, they were at the peak. They were back-to-back constructors champion or they drivers. had back-to-back drivers championship sorry and so it's hard to like go from such a high high to then having this horrible thing at Le Mans happen and then you're just done yeah like that's, so it's, it's pretty wild yeah so it's, it's just really fascinating to me like what that would have been like because Mercedes their their genealogy starts again in the 70s but you still had that gap of not you know the of them not being there all the other teams that were there and I'm just very curious to what it would have been like if Mercedes was one of the longest serving teams in Formula One yeah and then we have what you know starts this the current era of their family tree which is Tyrell Racing which start Tyrell Racing Racing is interesting because it started in 1970 but Technically, there was a little team called Mantra International that started in 68 that was on the grid for two seasons in 68 and 69. Um, And this is where Jackie Stewart won his championships. So that's another fun little tie in between the the histories of, of Red Bull and Mercedes. But Ken Tyrell started with Mantra and then Mantra turned into Tyrell. But technically mantra was not the like is not on the line but that's like kind of where it got its start it's a little it's a little complicated but i think it's, it's it's so interesting like all these like little teams and how they like pop in and pop out of the sport no it really is and it's also interesting to see like when they were on the grid versus other teams like we were just right. talking about red bull right but red bull that team in general really didn't even hit the grid until the 90s. Until the 90s, exactly. And so what we're talking about now is the 70s. So we're like jump, we're hopping a bit in time, but like this team started, or not started, like you said, it was Mantra. Their first F1 race was in 1970 at the Canadian Grand Prix. It only took them four races. As Tyrell, win, yeah. As Tyrell to win. And that was the 199th Grand Prix. So yeah. like it's it's crazy to like see like how all of these teams are today, but how long of the careers some of them have had and how short some of them are as well. Yeah, exactly. And th- their best season, of course, was the 1971 World Championship win and Jackie Stewart's uh, second Drivers' Championship when he also won his first with Mantra. But yeah, and they 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 were actually really like they had a really strong start. They finished P two in seventy two and seventy three, and then P three in seventy four and seventy six. So they were a pretty dominant organization. And this team lasted until nineteen ninety eight. So we have you know this is one of those teams that is a that has a very long history and you know long you know stamp in Formula One. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Ferrari obviously has been around forever. McLaren, Williams Racing has always kind of been Williams Racing. But this, I would say that Tyrell Racing is one of the longest stints of a team that's no longer, the name is no longer on the grid. I I would say that that's probably either accurate or close to it. Yeah, like 28 years is a really long time. And again, comparing to Ferrari, I would like to note (laughs) that they only had two team principals. They probably only would have had one. But um, Tyrell sold the team, so Craig Pollock took over the team after he sold. But Ken Tyrell was the team principal from 1970 to 1997. Yeah, and I mean, Not and also I think it's a little it's a little different. Like Ferrari as an organization, yes, it started from like the Ferrari family and Enzo Ferrari, but 
th- these types, of, but like it, it became, you know, an organizational thing, very similar right. to what we That's have with fair. Mercedes. That's whereas fair. Tyrell was Ken Tyrell's team. And the reason that he sold it was because he was getting old. I mean, he, you know, he, he it was, he, he, he was no, getting old. Yeah, yeah. He was, his health was poor. I think he, he died in 2001. I, I, some, some like early 2000s and his, you know, with his last season as team principal in 1997, like he had to, he had to give it up. But what I, what's also really interesting to me is like some of these drivers of note are drivers that have, you know, had world championships and had, you know, great seasons with other teams. Jean Alesi, who has been basically everywhere. Jody Schechter won a championship with Ferrari. Jos Verstappen, he's back in. And then of course, everyone's favorite, Martin Brundle. He also drove, like Martin Brundle, I think has been called one of the best Formula One drivers to have never won a race. And what, another interesting tie-in to commentary is Jonathan Palmer drove for Tyrell and he's the father of former, former Formula One driver and current commentator, Julian Palmer. Exactly. Yeah, no, this is a really interesting, I mean, again, 28 years of racing, so you're going to have these names, but I always forget that Martin Brundle raced for them, like always. Yeah. And I know yeah. that he's never won, and I know that he's the be- one of the best drivers who's, who's never won, but it never clicks with me that it's Tyrell. Yeah, it's, it's funny just like remembering, like, oh yeah, he was on the grid, he drove for this team, and he drove for, for a few teams in his career but yeah it was it's just it's wild to me like how these you know pop up and how they go but yeah then once Craig Pollock took over in 98 that was the last year of Tyrell Racing and then we bring in a brand that's really entertaining to me and also to you because as we know currently cigarette companies are no longer allowed to advertise in formula one so we have like weird funky workarounds but british and american racing took over in 1999 uh financially supported by british american tobacco (laughs) and this like literally like ford motor company buying stewart racing and turning it into jaguar to advertise the jaguar car british american tobacco basically took over tyrell racing to be an advertising board for lucky strike and 555 cigarette brands and that that's just something that you don't see anymore like marlboro and ferrari like that you can't do that anymore and but back back then cigarettes were the thing hey it was what the 90s early yes but see that's also what's interesting to me because i in my mind that ban or like the restriction on who can be an advertiser they don't allow out like true alcohol um or tobacco they have like um estrella whatever zero percent but like no true right alcohol brand I, for some reason, thought that went into effect, like, early 90s. Like, way early 90s. But yeah, it no. was a team that was actually just supported by tobacco early, in, going into the early 2000s. Like, to me, that seems too late to place that band. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I, it also, like, we have the American perspective on, you know, cigarettes and, like, the anti-cigarette, you know, marketing where, like, cigarettes and smoking and all that are, the the perception is very different in Europe. And, of course, Formula One is part of a French entity. Right. That's fair. Yeah. That is fair. That is, that's a very good point. Very yeah. Good point. So that's, that's something that I also forget. And like, you know, growing up in the nineties and seeing like all the bad, you know, smoking is bad advertisements. And then remembering that the United States looks at that very differently compared to especially Europe and also France. Yeah. So the thing that's interesting about this team is that it went from having one ownership um, and it was Tyler racing for 28 years, give or take a year. Math is hard. And then it goes into kind of this pattern of really short stints as other teams. So right. like this um, British American racing was from 1999 to 2005. So really short span. Um, didn't have a ton of success. And then they move into from there to Honda racing F1 team. And that was a team for two years. So it's, and then obviously they were Braun and now they're Mercedes, but they kind of like went for such a long time being a team. And then it's like, Boop, boop, boop. New team, new team, new team. 
Yeah, it, it, it passed hands a few times. And, you know, to go into the Honda portion, which was only three seasons, 2006 to 2008, we were also talking about this before we started recording. Like Honda's so funny to me because they're so interested in being part of like motorsport and like international, you know, notoriety when it when the going is good. Uh, when they when they have a goal that they can't achieve. But when they've reached their goals or the economy takes a downturn, the first thing that Honda, you know, chops to, has on the chopping block is motorsport like they because they they started they were they were a team in the 60s they withdrew due to difficulties selling road cars in the united states which doesn't come to much surprise especially you know american brands and all of that stuff back 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 in that time and then of course there was a driver who died at the 1968 french grand prix so they left then they returned as an engine manufacturer in the 80s and actually were you know they they were tearing it up constructors wise between mclaren and williams from the late 80s to early 90s and then they basically said well we've done all that there is to do so bye peace out and then they came back in 2006 as the Honda racing F1 team. Yeah. It's super interesting to see the history of Honda. Mm -hmm. every, like if you think of Honda now, people just think Red Bull soon to think of Aston Martin yeah. when they move again, just talking about the future, but they had this whole life in the sixties and seventies um, before that. It's just interesting. Yeah. And then, so 2006, they were still Lucky Strike Honda. And then in 2007, once they had, once that ban on, on tobacco branding really kicked in, then it was just Honda F1. They had a win um, at the Hungarian Grand Prix in 2006 <laughs> by Jensen Button. Um, it of was course. the, it was only the 13th Honda race of that current era. But if we consider the original era in the sixties, it was Honda's 48th race and the 763rd all time formula one race. Interesting. See, yeah. I love this time hop that we're doing. It's just, oh. yeah. I just love yeah, looking so at how long it takes for teams to win their first race. If they do. I do too. I do too. And I mean, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. It was the 13th race, right? So not bad. Yeah. Especially if you look at like even Red Bull took 70, what, 74 races before they won their, you know, before they got their first win. And this was also the Jensen Button, Rubens Barrichello years of that team. They were, they were really, they were there for, for quite a while. And then we moved to Braun. Then we get Braun. Which, of course, came into existence due to the 2008 global financial crisis, where, once again, Honda says, we got to scale back. We, we're not selling things, so we're not going to have fun in motorsport. So we're going to sell this team for a dollar. Yep. And the team principal, Ross Braun, purchased the team, and he was the founder. And sadly, they were only around for one year. Yeah, but... but to great success. Just just a little bit. They are the only team in existence to have a 100% championship rate, <laughs> which I love. Were they only around for one season? Yes. yes. Are they still 100% championship rate? Uh, yeah. Success rate? Absolutely. And we actually did a whole episode on Braun. There's a really great Braun series on, I think, Disney+, Plus, Star+, Plus, Hulu, yeah. depending on where you are in the world. Um, Kevin and I like did a deep dive. We watched it, commented on it you know, had a whole conversation on how the team came to be, all their wins and success and stuff like that. So I highly suggest that you guys check that out. It's linked um, above. And then also just watch the documentary because it's really cool. It's really good. Yeah. Um, they got almost every big person involved with the Braun team, including the drivers, to sit down for it, which I think is great because sometimes these documentaries, like you don't get everybody and then you like don't get the full picture and it's very like one-sided POV. Um, but I really enjoyed how they really got everyone that should have been in the documentary. Yeah, no, they they really, th this, it's one of the, haven't seen a lot of, of Formula One motorsport documentaries <laughs> in my my young Formula One career, but it is, it is, it was done very, very well, very entertaining. It's four episodes. It'll take like eight hours of your time. You could probably watch it in a day if you're crazy, but it's, it's such a fascinating season, especially when you have, you know, 
there's like such dominance the first half of the season and then clinging to, you know, Button had to cling to the lead of the championship as Red Bull made its charge going into the latter half. Very similar to what Max Verstappen is doing, you know, holding off Lando's charge for the driver's championship in 2024. Look at us talking about the present. I think we need to give ourselves points for this because this is the most we've talked about 2024 in any episode. (laughs) I know, right? But yeah, so th- there's not a lot to talk about with Braun, but there's a lot to talk about with Braun, which you can listen to that episode and watch a documentary. Yes. Okay, so moving on from Braun, we now have Mercedes AMG Patron- Petronas F1 team. Look at me and my my Toto impersonation. Yes. Um, so this is, it. Sh- it should be very clearly stated, this is not Mercedes Benz. There's a difference. (laughs) Technically, the Mercedes is part of the organization in in existence called Mercedes-Benz, but this is Mercedes-AMG Petronas. Exactly, exactly. So they came to the grid right after Braun. So Braun had that one season, and then Mercedes took over in 2010, and they are the team that we know now. Mercedes AMG Petronas F1 team. Yeah, which <laughs> we say it. you'll see, and you, you will see this when you watch the documentary. Is this all really wouldn't have come to pass had Petronas not been interested in coming on as one of the title sponsors? Because Mercedes was considering, you know, making a return to F1 in motorsport yeah. around this time, but it really wasn't until they made that deal with Petronas that we have the team that we know today. Exactly. Exactly. Um, So their first entry was in 2010 when they took over the team at the Bahrain Grand Prix. And this is wild. Their drivers were Michael Schumacher and Nico Rosberg. Right. Like, Nico Rosberg drove with Michael Schumacher and Lewis Hamilton. Yeah. That's insane. I think what's insane for me is that and also the fact that Mercedes in this era has only ever had five drivers. What? Yeah. Schumacher, Rosberg, Hamilton, Botas, Russell. Oh my god, I didn't even realize that. Yeah, those are the only Mercedes drivers of this era, which makes sense, but also like doesn't. Soon to be six. Soon to be Kimi six. Kimmy, Kimmy, Kimmy Antonelli. Not Kimmy Raikkonen. Kimmy Antonelli. <laughs> We've been talking about the past too much. Now I can't talk about the future. Oh my gosh, what's happening? Oh, we're broken. Um, but that's insane. Like, yeah. Because it's not like it's a two or three season stint. It's been, what, 15 seasons? Uh, Through this season? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's wild. I mean, if you look at like the longevity of these contracts... Right. It's really you know, impressive, though. Yeah, I mean, Schumacher didn't spend a lot of time at Mercedes because this was toward the end of his career. But Rosberg was on the team all the way up until he retired after 2016. That's crazy. Yeah. And then we had Botas for a few years, and now we have George. Wow. Oh, yeah. George. Oh, well, it did take them a little bit to get their first win. So they started on the grid on, in 2010. And they, this is so weird now to talk about, like, things in present day. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like we've been talking about so much in the past, and now, anyways, I digress. Um, yeah. But it took, uh, their first win was at the 2012 Chinese Grand Prix. There's a lot of first wins at the Chinese Grand Prix. Right? Isn't that yeah. interesting? Yeah. Um, but that was by Nico Rosberg. So that was the team's first win. It was the 41st F1 race of this new era, Mercedes. Um, and the 861st F1 Grand Prix. If you want to give the old Mercedes some credit, it was the 53rd race of Mercedes. Yes, of course, there were wins within those first 53, but this was the first of the modern. But if you want to count all told, I think it's interesting. They've never finished lower than P5 in the championship, and that was once in 2012. Wow. Yeah, like... If if we talk, you know, modern heavyweights, that is, you know, these two teams, they had eight construct, you know, eight consecutive constructors championships from 2014 to 2021. And then, of course, we had seven drivers championships between Lewis Hamilton and Nico Rosberg. That's yeah, so I many. Mean, honestly, the last 15 years, it has been Red Bull and Mercedes. Like, they are just 
They are the the heavy hitters, the titans. Um, it's really impressive if you think about it in terms of these two teams. Yeah, exactly. And and really, it was Mercedes getting it wrong with the new regulation in 2022 that has led to them kind of being out of the picture ever since the you know Verstappen Hamilton battle of 2021. Like that, yeah. that was other than 2021 fundamentally changing Lewis Hamilton as a driver, but that is my personal opinion and not the fact of the car being bad for three years, two and a half years. I think it changed the spinning of the earth. I agree. Um, <laughs> it was, it was quite, quite the adventure. And if you don't know what we're talking about, why are you listening to this podcast? If you don't know what you were, you're talking kind about. Of uh, if you don't know what we're talking about, get an F1 TV, um, sc- you know, do your two free weeks of F1 TV and watch the 2021 Abu Dhabi Grand Prix race. Watch from the beginning to end. No, Just do Michael. It. No, no, Michael, no. I still want that mug I from the, the F- F- so there's, F1 so there's, an, there's an, the F1 experience, which is this, you know, traveling, you know, Formula One museum. Um, and one of the, the, things that they sell in the gift shop is a coffee mug with Toto's radio call of no, Michael, no, this is so not right from the end of the Abu Dhabi race. And I really, really, really want one. It's just so brutal that they did that to him. I know, but I love it. It's one of those iconic moments of the sport. Yeah. Along with Toto throwing his headset. Yeah. In anger. Um, yeah, so there's there's a lot of context behind the 2021 Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. We'll probably have to do an F101 about it at some point eventually. But before we get there, we have to finish the genealogy series with two of the teams that we are the most excited about. Buckle in, guys, because holy balls, is part five going to be crazy? It's going to be like an hour and a half long episode, and I'm not even going to apologize for it because I'm so excited to talk about this. And if you ever thought I would put one of these teams and excited in the same sentence, I never would. But we are going to be covering Aston Martin and Alpine. Yep. I am so excited. I know Alpine is the, you know, forgotten team of the grid, but not when it comes to genealogy. And this is going to be such a cool, crazy, chaotic episode. Yeah, between Aston Martin and Alpine, not only have these teams changed hands in a bunch of really interesting ways, but we've also we've had, you know, financial crisis. We've had F one, you know, taking over a team, and putting them into administration, which is something that you really only hear about with like hockey teams and pro soccer leagues in Europe. We've got teams that have been banned. We've had teams that have been almost bankrupted for funny reasons. Um, it. I'm so excited to talk about these two teams and this, I have a lot of research to do over, you know, over this weekend to prepare for this episode, but I'm so excited to talk about these teams. No. And I think these two teams, like when we started this, these were the two where we were like, Oh my gosh, it's going to be such a great episode. There's going to be so much to talk about. We've been dying to talk about force India. So we finally get to do that. Um, And yeah, like Catherine said, all of these crazy up and downs, all affect these two teams so it's going to be exciting to talk about yeah fascinating so we'll get there and that episode will come out at some point in the not too distant future i think next tuesday tbd because time is hard yes Yes. look out for part five also if you haven't caught parts one through three make sure you catch up on those they are really interesting fun if you think there's nothing exciting to learn about ferrari just listen to just wait answer about it it's so great um, but yeah, so look forward to part five, Aston Martin Alpine. But this has been part four of our F101 F1 team genealogy series <laughs> covering Red Bull and Mercedes. Thanks for going off track with us, guys.